Good evening, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferry. I'm the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Whether you're joining us physically here in our theater or watching on our YouTube, or joining us with our um, friends from C-SPAN 2, welcome, and happy Bill of Rights Day. Since President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, first proclaimed it on December 15th, 1941, the day has served as a reminder that we should not take for granted the rights protected in this document. Our partner for tonight's program on the Bill of Rights in the 21st century is the Constitutional Sources Project, and we thank them for their support. Before we begin tonight's discussion, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up here next month. On Tuesday, January 17th, at noon, journalist and author Brett Baer will talk about his new book, Three Days in January, Dwight Eisenhower's Final Mission, which is about Eisenhower's prophetic farewell address. Then at noon on the next two days, January 18th and 19th, we'll show a selection of films from our motion picture holdings. The program is called From the Vaults, Presidential Inaugurations, and will focus on historical inaugural events. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibitions, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online at archives.gov. There are copies in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it by regular mail or email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to become more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities and their applications for membership in the lobby also. The United States Constitution is the oldest written national constitution still in force. One of the reasons why it has endured is the allowance that framers made for peacefully amending it. And one of the first actions of the first federal Congress in 1789 was to pass a set of amendments we call the Bill of Rights. It was necessary, stated James Madison, to expressly declare the great rights of mankind secured under this constitution. During this 225th anniversary year, the National Archives put together a nationwide program of events and exhibits to celebrate and examine the Bill of Rights. We've hosted several discussions like tonight's relating to constitutional rights. We've put on a series of national conversations on rights and justice around the country, and we've created several exhibits and educational resources. I hope you had the opportunity to see the special exhibit Amending America upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. Outside Washington, D.C. area, you may have the opportunity to see the companion traveling exhibit Amending America, the Bill of Rights. It's currently in Dallas, Texas, and will soon be in Houston. The centerpiece of all this activity is the 225-year-old parchment document itself, the original Bill of Rights in the rotunda for the Charters of Freedom. In fact, it was, it was on a Bill of Rights Day in 1952 that all three charters, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights were first displayed together in the rotunda. At the ceremony to unveil the documents, President Harry Truman declared that, in my opinion, the Bill of Rights is the most important part of the Constitution of the United States, the only document in the world that protects the citizen against its gov his government. He also warned against letting the documents become no better than mummies in their glass cases. Judging from what I have seen, the crowds of people who visit the rotunda every year do not consider the charters to be mere, mere curiosities. They and our distinguished panel of judges here tonight know that the Bill of Rights has meaning for us every day. To introduce our panelists, I'll, re I'll turn you over to Julie Silverbrook the executive director of our partner this evening, the Constitutional Sources Project. Julie. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Julie Silverbrook, and I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the Constitutional Sources Project, or CONSOURCE for short. We're an organization devoted to educating citizens of all ages about the history of the United States Constitution. I invite you to explore our free digital library of historical documents tracing the creation, ratification, and amendment of the Constitution at consource.org. 
Let me begin by thanking the Archivist of the United States for his introductory remarks and, for, and thanking the National Archives for partnering with Consource to host this evening's special Bill of Rights Day event celebrating the 225th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights on December 15, 1791. The Bill of Rights articulates our national values and ideals, including the guarantee of freedom of speech, religion, and the press, the right to assemble, the promise of a speedy trial by jury, the protection against double jeopardy and unreasonable searches and seizures, and the recognition of the right to bear arms. The Bill of Rights strikes a personal chord the way the Declaration of Independence does and the structural provisions of the Constitution do not, at least not for most. And yet too few Americans know the history of our Bill of Rights. A survey found last year, and I kid you not, that one in 10 Americans think the Bill of Rights includes the right to own a pet. For the record, it doesn't. And so before I invite our, our moderator and distinguished panelists to the stage to discuss the Bill of Rights in the 21st century, we thought it would be useful to provide our guests here in McGowan Auditorium and the folks viewing the program at home with a very brief history of the Bill of Rights in the 18th century, which is when the document was drafted and ratified. So if you bear with me, I'm going to give you the legislative history of the Bill of Rights in two minutes, or I'm going to try. So some folks might be surprised to learn that when the Constitution was signed in September 1787, it did not include a Bill of Rights. When George Mason of Virginia proposed that a Bill of Rights be added to the Constitution five days prior to the end of the Constitutional Convention, his proposal was near unanimously rejected. The prevailing view was that the state declarations of rights were sufficient and a federal Bill of Rights was unnecessary and possibly even dangerous. And so the Constitution was submitted to the states for ratification with no Bill of Rights. And while the Bill of Rights became a rallying call for anti-federalists, those who opposed ratification of the Constitution, they were also interested in uh, proposing amendments that would alter the structure and power of the new federal government. For federalists like James Madison, who we call the father of the Constitution, he's also the father of the Bill of Rights, the latter was unacceptable. Madison's decision to draft and push the first Congress to pass the Bill of Rights uh, should be understood in this context. Once the Constitution was adopted, newly elected Representative James Madison urged the first Congress to reject amendments that would change the structure of the Constitution, and those proposed amendments came out of a number of state ratifying conventions, and instead adopt a Bill of Rights as suggested by the ratifying conventions in Virginia and New York. By 1788, James Madison had also come to see the broader value of the Bill of Rights. He wrote to Thomas Jefferson saying that the political truths declared in that solemn manner acquire by degrees the character of fundamental maxims of free government, and as they become incorporated with the national sentiment, counteract the impulses of interest and passion. Madison intended to insert his proposed amendments into the body of the Constitution. This is ultimately rejected by Congress. The House instead votes on seven supplements to the Constitution, and that goes over to the Senate for consideration where the Senate reduces that number to 12. Those 12 amendments are then sent to the state for ratification, and the anniversary that we're celebrating tonight is when Virginia, on December 15, 1791, becomes the 10th of 14 states to approve 10 of the 12 amendments, the 10 amendments that we now call our Bill of Rights. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the Bill of Rights, I invite you to explore its legislative history in the Consource Digital Library and pick up the Washington Spot Times special report on the Bill of Rights, which is available right outside of McGowan Auditorium. Both Consource and the National Archives provided articles for that special report, which is also available online on the Washington Times website. And with that, I will invite our moderator, Jess Braven, who covers the Supreme Court for the Wall Street Journal to the stage, along with our distinguished panelists, Judge Thomas Griffith, Judge Patricia Millette, and Judge Andre Javis. Thank you, and happy Bill of Rights Day. Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming out on one of the coldest Bill of Rights days in recent memory uh, here for our discussion on the 225th anniversary of the ratification. Of course, I want to thank uh, Mr. Ferriero and Ms. Silverbrook for that introduction. 
Uh, and uh, I have to say, you know, as someone who covers uh, the Supreme Court and, and, uh, and the appellate courts uh, as they interpret the Bill of Rights and other constitutional provisions. It's a great uh, privilege to have uh, three esteemed circuit judges talk about uh, our first 10 amendments to the Constitution and what they mean because, you know, they are on the front lines of figuring out what those words mean. They are not always self-explanatory and as judges they confront hard problems about what those rights mean here in the 21st century, and we'll be confronting them uh, in the years ahead. So Judge Griffith, Judge Davis, Judge Millett, thank you so much for coming out. We don't expect you to prejudge any cases, but I'm sure that our audience here and on C-SPAN will appreciate how to think about the Bill of Rights and how to think about these questions and how to imagine what issues will rise in the future and what uh, the different ways uh, we might have of applying these, uh, uh, I won't say ancient, but uh, quite, uh, quite old words uh, in, uh, in a digital era. So thanks again for coming. We'll have questions later on, but we are going to try to have a, a, a conversational discussion about the Bill of Rights. I thought, though, just as a start, uh, you know, the, uh, the White House issues a lot of uh, proclamations and precatory announcements and so forth. And one of those that uh, you know, was emailed out uh, yesterday was the President's uh, Bill of Rights uh, proc uh, Day proclamation. Uh, I don't know how different it is from those that are issued uh, every year, because I haven't read them every year. But I thought in light of tonight's <laughs> uh, presentation, we might look at what President Obama had to say about it. And uh, in his message to citizens, he said that, uh, as originally created, the Bill of Rights safeguarded personal liberties and ensured equal justice under the law for many, but not for all. And in the centuries that followed its ratification, courageous Americans agitated and sacrificed to extend these rights to more people. And he goes on to say that uh, uh, he talks about the way the rights were expanded as the country cast off the stains of slavery, women reached for the ballot, workers organized for their rights, these uh, experiences remind us that our freedom is intertwined with the freedom of others. And then he adds, uh, and you can read the whole thing, of course, on the White House website if you wish, uh, that the progress that the nation saw was never inevitable, uh, but as long as people remain willing to fight for justice, we can work to swing open more doors of opportunity, carry forward a vision of liberty and equality for generations to come. And so that sort of leads us to, I, I think, think about the Bill of Rights. Is it something that is static and that is frozen in the year 1791, uh, or is it something that is applied differently or evolves, or is there some way of reconciling both the original language of the Bill of Rights and circumstances that we see today that are perhaps a little different than even very wise people like James Madison uh, uh, might have foreseen uh, back in the 18th century. So that's, I think, you know, what are we talking about? Are these words that only have relevance from their original uh, uh, conception, or do they take on different meanings uh, today? And I thought we could we could uh, throw it open. Uh, I think Judge Griffith, do you have seniority of this group? Uh, if so, do I? If, if so, if, if uh, then uh, then uh, then then with with that uh, great uh, distinction comes responsibility. Could okay. you, perhaps well, you could open well, our talk. Great. First of all, it's an uh, honor to be here, and I thank the National Archives and consource for doing this event. And I'm grateful to be here with my esteemed colleagues and with you, Jess. Uh, so uh, th th it turns out that question that you ask uh, lies at the heart of a rather vigorous debate uh, over the role of judges that has taken place since the framing of the Constitution. Uh, and uh, the, the views that I have developed over time uh, are, you, you used a phrase that might be kind of pejorative. You said, are, they, are, they, are they, the rights of the, bill, uh, of the Bill of Rights frozen in, in time? Um, um, I'm of the view that, uh, that there were certain values that were expressed uh, at the time of the founding, at the time of the Bill of Rights, um, and that they did express uh, uh, a, a definite view of the relationship between the individual and the state with respect to certain activities. Um, and that it's our responsibility as judges to enforce those, uh, but not to change them, right? I mean, uh, the job that, that we are about is not 
determining uh, the merits of a case by our own lights of what is right and just and equitable, uh, but by the law, in this case, as was ratified by the uh, people of the United States. And so, um, uh, so, I, so I, I'm, I'm of the school that, uh, that uh, if there are going to be changes that are made to the law, to the Bill of Rights, there's a, there's a method to do that, and that's the amendment process, but that it's, uh, it's not appropriate for unelected uh, judges who are, for the most part, politically unaccountable to make those, uh, to, to make those changes. Now, to be sure, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to it, the application of those principles to new circumstances uh, is, is necessary, but it, in my view, our job uh, our responsibility as, as a judge is to identify what is the value that, um, that is expressed uh, in the law, in this case in the amendments, in the Bill of Rights, uh, to identify that and then to apply it neutrally to the, to the dispute at, at hand. So. Does anybody disagree with that? I heard a lot of what I agree with from Judge, uh, and I want to join in thanking uh, the archives and you, Jess, and my colleagues for this opportunity. And I want to salute those of you who are seated out there for coming out on such a brutal night. <laughs> um, the Bill of Rights, uh, of course, didn't actually spring from Madison's head. Um, there were lots of state constitutions about at the time of ratification, and many of the rights that we see in the Bill of Rights had a, a very healthy and robust history, even as of 1791. Uh, and they're very interesting, aren't they, in so far as they contain both prescriptions and proscriptions uh, aimed at government and government's relation to the individual. Uh, but I agree with what's been said. The text hasn't changed. And I suppose, without being too semantical, the rights haven't changed, but the facts have changed. And technology has brought about many changes. Uh, and subsequent amendments have brought about many changes. And let's face it, Supreme Court decision making has changed. And all of that informs modern day interpretation of how one applies the Bill of Rights in the pragmatic reality of judge decision making here in the 21st century. And that shouldn't be remarkable, it seems to me. Well, and I would just add, first of all, thank you. I don't want to, I don't want to be repetitive, but I also don't want to uh, be unthankful and ungrateful for this opportunity. Um, I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is that in a day and age when we're used to uh, laws being almost weighed by the pound uh, in their length and size. The Bill of Rights is a really succinct and spartan document. You can fit these 10 foundational principles on one side of one page um, as a document. They are, and, 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 and the words are very succinct and cogent. Uh, people are guaranteed due process of law. Congress shall not make laws respecting an establishment of religion. There's not, I mean, that's what we have to work with. And those, those, those words are, you say frozen in time, they are written into our constitutional order, uh, into our constitutional document. Um, but, and, and those are the words. We don't change those words except through a process of constitutional amendment. But um, I think with your facts situation, um, applying those words to the varying factual circumstances and disputes that confront a country over the course of more than 200 years is what is challenging. And what, um, instead of sort of thinking of it as something that's frozen and immobile in any sort of negative way, I, I, I think of it as the phrase uh, we most commonly associate with Robert Frost, and that is good fences make good neighbors. Uh, now, Robert Frost didn't actually think it made nice neighbors in a human-to-human -human context, but I think in a political structure, in a governmental structure, a division of power like we have, it's actually apt. And what the Bill of Rights is, as part as a whole constitution is, but it's a hugely important uh, designation of fences. 
uh, division of power, you know, what government has, what it doesn't have, most importantly, what remains for the people. And so those fences are there, um, but policing them and figuring out where exactly that fence falls in, in, in new circumstances that are changing as the country changes is really the challenging task that we face. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, as a, as a, a parent of a, of a five-year-old girl, I would say that the word frozen has a very positive connotation yes, yeah. <laughs> for, uh, for some, some of the younger men. And not just girls. <laughs> and not just girls. Uh, so, uh, but, um, well, you know, the, uh, as late Justice Scalia often point out, the, you know, the, the basic constitution, most of what it concerns is the structure of government. The Bill of Rights is more about individual rights and about what rights an individual has to protect himself or herself from the, the government. Um, you know, but uh, but uh, Judge Millet, as you said, as 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 you all uh, have noted, the Supreme Court has has and, and the lower courts have no offense have applied those words over the centuries and tried to give them specific application as guidance to police, as guidance to individuals. What do they mean in these individual circumstances? How how far are we? I mean, is there now? Is there? Uh, an annotated Bill of Rights that you could say based on judicial interpretations and statutory uh, uh, elaborations that answers pretty much most of the questions that might arise under it? Or is there still a great unknown that's related to what those uh, very terse but eloquent words mean? Well, we don't need to go. We, we just started the seniority thing, but uh, <laughs> on the first We'll start from this end. But, yeah. But, yeah, sorry. Um, well, uh, to keep us employed, <laughs> there are, there are uh, and, and actually, as a matter of reality, there, it, is, it is actually amazing how often, uh, I've said to colleagues as a practicing lawyer, as a judge, to law clerks going, I can't believe this hasn't been answered uh, by now. And that's because uh, you know, while the, the fences uh, are written in the Constitution, uh, the country itself keeps growing and changing, and the nature of government changes. Um, and, and new questions arise, and technologies come along, and you know, what's a, a reasonable search of a stagecoach versus a reasonable search of you know, a car using GPS technology? Uh, how do you answer those questions? So it, it, it does keep, the issues do keep changing um, and coming up in, in, in new forms. Um, we, you know, on, on, uh, on the DC circuit, um, have jurisdiction over Guantanamo. Uh, something you know about, and uh, how the Constitution applies to uh, enemy combatants detained um, in uh, land rented by the United States in a foreign country. Well, as it turns out, it hadn't been answered when it first came up, and it had to be answered. So there's just new applications that arise all the time. And, and I think it we're turns out the first answer we gave was not acceptable to, <laughs> to the Supreme Court. <laughs> that was before I came along. That, that's right. <laughs> Um, just kidding. Um, uh, so I think it's you know it, it is it's important that we as, as you said that we're not here to rewrite the Constitution. I don't think uh, any of us want to do that, and that's I don't want to live in a country where judges just get to rewrite the Constitution at liberty. I think we can see countries like that around the world, and that's not what we want to be. But to struggle really hard and mightily with our colleagues to figure out how it applies is uh, is a, is a challenge. Yeah, on the question of whether all the answers are in, of course, the answer is absolutely not. Um, it's remarkable how much hasn't been decided. And it, it's equally phenomenal how we haven't even thought of so many questions yet. Um, when, I, when I teach law school, I often point out with emphasis that it wasn't until 1976 that the Supreme Court actually decided the question do you need an arrest warrant to arrest a person in a public place? Now, you might think, considering the Fourth Amendment and 200 years plus of, of, of criminal adjudication, that question surely would have been presented well before 1976. But there it was. Um, another simple example under the Fourth Amendment, do you need an arrest warrant to make a routine felony arrest in a person's home? Supreme Court said yes, 1980. And you can understand why law students at the time would, would think, wait a minute, surely the Supreme Court's gotten around to answering that question. So there are 
there are lots of fairly obvious questions that we can anticipate, but so many that we can't possibly anticipate that are surely, uh, if not yet in the pipeline, are on their way to, to the courts. And, and I have my theory for why that's taking place and why the Bill of Rights is therefore perhaps more relevant today than it's ever been. Uh, and that's because we live in a time where there's been this vast expansion of the power of government, right? And so, and the Bill of Rights is supposed to uh, help regulate the interaction between the government and individual liberty. And as government power has increased significantly uh, over the last 40, 50, 60 years or so, those issues come up. I mean, more and more we find that individuals' interactions with the government implicate liberty interests and other uh, interests protected by uh, the Bill of Rights. And so that's why I think it's an ever-present uh, issue, ever-present uh, challenge. So it really isn't f frozen uh, in time. These really aren't dusty old uh, concepts by uh, people wearing three-cornered hats. They were, they were alive then. Uh, and I think in many ways they're more alive today uh, than, than ever as we try to figure out what does, it, what does liberty, what do these other rights mean in the modern setting where, uh, where the government has such uh, vast uh, uh, power into virtually every nook and cranny of, uh, of, of, our, of our lives. So. Judge Griffin makes a good point. Um, I'll remind us how uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist made it a routine part of his annual message on the judiciary, um, lamenting the federalization of crimes. It seems that for a decade or more, this was always a part of his end of the year message to Congress and to the people. Uh, and that's yeah. the point that you're making by your comment, Judge. Well, if I could also add, though, there's another thing, um, and that's also uh, monumental changes that have happened over time and uh, to whom the Bill of Rights applies or to whom it protects. Uh, as originally enacted, uh, it, with, with the anniversary of celebrating it, applied as limitations on the federal government only, not the states. Um, and who the people were was a much narrower bunch than it has come to be over time, where you know, both through the Civil War, through the power of women, women and, 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 and as our society has grown, the number of people uh, and the understanding of its protections and its application after the Civil War uh, most of its provisions <laughs> to, uh, to the states. And so the, it's, it's a bit younger document in that sense, not chronologically, but in the breadth and scope of its application than I think a lot of people understand uh, up front. And I guess the last thing I would say is it's not only the government changes, but I think there must be something about human nature um, and how we interact with each other because you know the Ten Commandments have been around way longer um, and people still fight about what that equally succinct document uh, says and means and how it applies to everything in their daily lives. So maybe it's something about the nature of humans as, as our interactions change, we just keep debating over how documents operate in that context. Just a little no historical note, you know, there's a, uh, many communities around the country, you can see a Ten Commandments monolith in front of a public building or, or elsewhere. It actually was, believe it or not, a marketing campaign for the movie. Uh, and uh, we wrote about this. There was a, a uh, the, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the uh, Fox Studios and uh, the Fraternal Order of Eagles had a, a great marketing thing where stars from the picture went and unveiled these monoliths around the country. So there's an interesting story there. But that'll be on another night at the archives. Tonight, though, we're that returning. Supreme Court cases. <laughs> that's exactly right, and involving the First Amendment, which we'll, we'll, we'll get back to. So, Jess, can mm -hmm. I, I, so I think something that's worth uh, commenting on has, has just occurred in our in our agreement about something that's very fundamental. So we began by saying we all agree that the role of a judge <clears throat> is to understand what the amendment means and to apply it dispassionately. We all have different backgrounds. We're <clears throat> appointed by different presidents. And that's a view that we all share. Um, that's not a view that is shared universally. There are uh, many in the, in the academy. Uh, and there have been times in our nation's past where some judges took a very uh, different view, thought that the, that the provisions of the Constitution were an invitation to judges to um, 
construct their own vision of fairness or justice. And, and that's just not a view that, that, uh, that reigns, at least in my experience, that reigns uh, at least on uh, my court or the courts of appeals. Uh, and I think it's really important for the American uh, people to, to, to know that. Uh, the judiciary has, uh, uh, battles over the judiciary have, are highly political. Uh, but in, in my experience, 11 years on the, the D.C. Circuit, th this, is, this is the view of, of judges, regardless of the president who appointed them. Uh, and that is, it's the, the, as Justice Kagan said it at her confirmation hearings, it's the law all the way down, right? Mm -hmm. It's law at, at every step. It's not, you're not you're, judges aren't using their position to advance their own uh, view of what the just society ought to be. We're, we're, we're doing the best that we can to follow the law as uh, enacted by, uh, uh, by we the people. Uh, and something uh, Judge Davis said I think is really uh, important in terms of how the three of us go about it. Uh, we don't get to uh, look at the Constitution, understand its history, and decide uh, on our own what it means, because we are, as the Constitution says, we all belong to infer an inferior court, right? <laughs> it's, the, it's the Supreme Court uh, that, that, uh, that's the ultimate arbiter, at least as far as we're concerned, of what those provisions uh, mean. And so that means that even if I have a personal view that would differ from the Supreme Court's about the meaning of some provision of the Constitution, uh, Stare decisis precedent requires that these three judges here and our colleagues follow what uh, uh, the Supreme Court says. Now, this might be a more interesting discussion if we were three justices, right? Because the, 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 the rules work a, we, we, rules work a little differently uh, for them. Hey, there's an opening I hear. So if you want right. to raise your hand, um, I've, I've never heard a more elegant description of Lochner versus New York. <laughs> I, th I think it was buried in there. Uh, well, we'll uh, that's, a, that's a due process question. We'll, we'll get to that. One, one point just for the audience, for people who may not be uh, 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 versed in, in, in legal scholarship, that you know, in law, the, the, a later enacted measure takes precedence over something that came before, or at least helps interpret something that came before. And so what, what the judges were talking about is that you had other amendments, like the 14th Amendment and, and subsequent amendments, that give a perhaps a, a, another angle to look at prior enacted provisions that initially only applied to the, the federal government under the Bill of Rights. And, that's, and because there are suggestions in the 14th Amendment about application of the Bill of Rights to the states, but not a direct command, that's left a, a fair bit of leeway that we've seen uh, over per, in the 20th century, particularly about how those measures uh, apply. But that's just sort of a background that, yes, it's not frozen. There have been subsequent amendments, which in some ways give more meaning to the words that came before and reflected what people saw at the time, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, uh, well, let's... Well, well, the classic example mm -hmm. of that, of course, I'm backing you up here, Jess. Um, there's no equal protection clause in the Fifth Amendment, but there's an equal protection clause in the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, one of the Civil War amendments. And, and, and the Supreme Court seems to me correctly inferred that the meaning of due process in the Fifth Amendment surely must include the equal protection guarantee that's more explicit, not more explicit, is explicit in the 14th Amendment. So that's sort of a historically iconic and, example. And is, there, and is there a specific thing that would be different, perhaps, if, if it wasn't? Well, <laughs> if there were an equal protection clause in the Fifth Amendment, Maybe the Fourteenth Amendment wouldn't have been necessary. Could be, could be. But uh, but uh, Judge Davis is. Uh, I think you're talking about a very famous case from the '50s, where after Brown versus Board of Education found that uh, equal protection of the Fourteenth Amendment applied to the states. Uh, there wasn't the words equal protection applying to the federal government. D.C. federal enclave had segregated schools. Could you possibly have a situation where segregation was illegal in all the fifty states, but completely constitutional in the United States? In the, capital of the United States, I'd be like saying people here couldn't vote or something for Congress. <laughs> so, uh, preposterous. So, uh, uh, a little, a little constitutional though. joke there, uh, for, for, forgive me. It's, uh, Bill of Rights Day is always kind of a fun day. Fun day. So, uh, well, let's talk about some of the specific uh, provisions of the Bill of Rights and see how they might apply. Now, the first clauses in the Bill of Rights apply to religion. 
got the Congress uh, can't, uh, as you say, made, uh, make uh, uh, passing laws respecting establishment of religion or, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We've seen those clause, the, the free exercise clause, the establishment clause be very important in, in litigation uh, around the country. They constantly come up. They're the first words uh, in the Bill of Rights, and yet they still are a measure of uh, of uh, dispute over what exactly they mean in each particular case. Uh, they apply equally to very established religions like uh, Christianity or Judaism or Islam and newer ones like uh, Sumim from uh, Utah, which believes in mummification uh, and had its own alternative uh, uh, bill, uh, uh, Ten Commandments that they wanted to put up on monoliths. How do you figure out uh, what those words mean. I mean, establishment of religion to someone in the 18th century maybe meant the established Church of England, right? Or the, the official government church. That's what establishment meant. Uh, what do they mean now when we have a country with many, many, many more religions where a government is not in a position to judge and shouldn't be the validity of one religion over another, uh, where government programs and policies may conflict with uh, uh, tenets of different religions, and all you've got are those half dozen words or what have you in the, in the First Amendment to figure it out. How, how, how do you even approach a question like that? Well, this is where the work of organizations like Con Consource comes in to be so helpful. It, in many ways, it's a matter of history. I mean, we're talking about trying to recover, not to recover, trying to understand what, what did the framers intend by that? What was the, what was the understanding? Uh, of, of, the, of the public at the time that the that the amendment was uh, was was ratified, um, and that that's a that's a historical quest. Now we're not historians, at least I'm not a historian, uh, and so we're generalists. Um, but the, at least as I perceive it, the, the the quest that we're on is a historical quest to identify once again to identify what is the value that's being protected or expressed, and then. How does that apply in a circumstance which may be very different in, in some ways than was before? But uh, at least that's how, that's how I, I approach it. I start with the history uh, of the matter. Well, and I would say that, um, first of all, you know, you, you have to start with the whole text. That's one thing. So it's not just an establishment of religion. It's laws respecting an establishment of religion. So we have to figure out what respecting means. Uh, and as well as what an establishment means and what a religion is for some of the, sometimes that becomes an issue in its own right. Now, uh, we're the lucky ones. Uh, we aren't taking the first cut at this document. It has been interpreted by uh, many judges and justices uh, before us. And so uh, in addition to history, we look at what a particular Supreme Court uh, has said, what it said those words mean in the lines that it has sort of drawn, how it said, where the fence shall lie. Um, and, and that at least gives us uh, a framework for trying to figure out how, it, how the next step in it, how the next link in the chain is supposed to go when you see the dividing lines that they have drawn, what, what is OK, what is not OK. Now that is you know, an ongoing, it is a work in progress in the sense that the new decisions are, are always coming. But I always find it really helpful to uh, look at, at, at those decisions and study them, not just for what they held in their case, but the reasoning and principles that they give, sharing their ideas on what those historical documents say and what the line was that the Bill of Rights meant to draw there with the words that it used. And, and I think interpretation also draws on the ongoing dialogue that takes place uh, between the people and the courts and especially between Congress and the courts. And particularly in the, uh, in the First Amendment context, Congress has spoken, drawing on what Congress believes those words mean or should mean, because Congress has a voice in the interpretation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights every bit as much as, as the courts do. Although courts, the Supreme Court, is the last word there are lots of other words out there to be spoken in the effort to draw meaning from these, from these words. So uh, I think that, hearkening back to your earlier comment, 
there is this dialogue that goes on that, as I say, plays a role uh, in figuring out what those words meant back then and what the practical application of those words are or should be today. If, if I could add, we, we as judges, people don't come to us and say, wow, here's an interesting constitutional question, what do you think? Um, we have, and this is not in the Constitution, an adversarial system of justice in which um, this part is that the Constitution cases come to us. We're passive in the sense that we don't reach out to decide issues. People have to come to us with, in terms of the body of the Constitution, cases or controversies. Um, and they present the dispute through you know, their, their lawyers and they will tell their story. Here is the problem. Here is the conflict. Here is its impact. Here's what it means. And that gives some real flesh to, literally some real flesh to, what the dispute is and evaluating you know, how is the government operating on this individual? Um, what impact is it having on their, is their religion that gives us a, a concrete framework in which to take those precedents, take those historical documents, and apply them? And so I think it's different than some other countries where courts may have a much more sort of almost, you know, what do you think role and be part of advisory, offering advisory opinions as it's often referred to. Um, we courts have a much more uh, um, circumspect role in that sense, which is, is consistent with, as, as Judge Griffith explained, uh, the fact that we're, you know, we're not elected and we're not writing a constitution. We're here to solve problems that people have. And, and this, this religious liberty issue it, it dramatizes in high relief uh, the, the, the currentness of the controversy over the, the, the meaning of the Bill of Rights. I mean, look, look something remarkable has happened in, in, in my life. Uh, back in 1993, um, the Congress of the United States unanimously passed a bill called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. President Clinton signed it with great ceremony in the Rose Garden. It was, he considered one of his signal achievements. Uh, there was unanimity about, uh, it was non -part, not a partisan issue. <clears throat> Here we are some 30 years later, and it's a very partisan issue. The, the, the phrase religious liberty itself is for many a code phrase uh, for bigotry. The same, effectively the same bill that was passed unanimously by Congress uh, causes a great deal of controversy in states today. Now, I'm just mentioning that to say how fluid the situation is and how alive these phrases are, you were saying, it's not, these things aren't settled. Uh, they're very much uh, alive. Uh, and, uh, you know, the courts today and in the coming years are going to be faced with these issues about what, do, what does religious liberty mean uh, today in the marketplace, in the, the public square? Um, and it's a fluid situation. Yeah, I mean, and, and because we're talking about the bill, you know, we're 15% into the 21st century, uh, we've got uh, a bit to go. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what are the questions? You know, I'm not asking for the answers, but what are the questions, maybe more specifically, we're going to see in terms of establishment of religion or free exercise of religion? What do you think might be coming down the pike uh, when we look at the. Uh, well, does it take a crystal ball on the free exercise? It's the, the, the tension between our national commitment to non-discrimination, right, to equal protection, and our national commitment to freedom of religion and how that, uh, how that plays out. I think that's a, I'm not a prophet, but that's, that's an issue that's not, it's right in front of us now. So I think on the free exercise side of it, that's the, uh, that, that's, that's Right, the and, I, and I think, you know, for the audience, when you think about what does exercise or free exercise of religion mean, one of the ways this issue has come up has been the Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriage. A lot of Americans have religious objections to it. To what extent do they have to, through their commercial activities, uh, uh, support or at least serve uh, same-sex uh, 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 marriages? So that's one of the issues we've seen, mainly in, uh, as a state court issue uh, under state anti-discrimination laws. But uh, you know what? What is that that boundary? But one can imagine many other types of questions coming up over the century ahead about 
you know, new, you know, different religions having different objections to different things that could arise, and, and drawing that line uh, is, is something that's hard. And I guess, you know, so that's, that's certainly one we're going to see, and that, that is a, interesting in that the Supreme Court has really uh, enunciated a right that was not recognized before, and it's caused, uh, you know, the uh, uh, reaction. Uh, what about... Uh, uh, well, I could just respond mm -hmm, sure. to that because I think um, it is not a linear process, right? We don't say, okay, you know, this year let's deal with the First Amendment. Like, we can march through it here, but that's not how it works. And so what happens is you had, um, you know, the Religious Supreme Restoration Act was a response to one Supreme Court decision contracting what had been the prior understanding of the scope of the free exercise clause. You, you have that going on, and then you've got, at the same time, there may be changes, or, or shortly thereafter, changes in the conception of the scope of the equal protection clause, um, and roles of states versus federal governments getting changed over here. So there's lots of pieces getting interpreted all the time by the Supreme Court. They're marching through all different amendments, uh, a variety of amendments every term, and it's how those pieces come back together that themselves create new issues, there are almost synergies that come out of this as we keep working our way through our Constitution and how it applies to our lives. So that's what can create new issues that before didn't seem to come up because the understanding and interpretation that the Supreme Court has given us has changed. And here, and here, in my view, here's the good news and the bad news. I mean, the good news is the Constitution seems to be a part of almost every political discussion that, that, that takes place in any election. And, and it's fashionable, and I, and I, I know uh, and Julie's got her pocket copy of the Constitution, and I think Judge Millette has hers, and Judge Davis has I've got a bigger <laughs> version of it, but it's fashionable in, the, uh, in, 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 in Washington amongst politicians to have your pocket Constitution, and I, that's great. The more education, the more discussion we have the Constitution, the better. That's the really good news. Now here's, from my vantage point, the bad news. It isn't easy to understand. It's, these, are, these, are, these are tough issues. And as Judge Millett said and Judge Davis said, they're, they're set forth in, seem in spare language, um, language much of which was written in the 18th century. We don't talk that way today. So there's just the, <laughs> the rhetorical uh, challenge of reading old language. But more than that, um, we have courts and individuals who struggled with these for, for, for years and to try and understand the historical setting to try and understand the development of, of, of the issues as they as they developed over the years. It's not it's not it's it's not easy it's not easy work. It's 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 hard work. But you know we can do hard things. Uh, that's the that that's what citizenship is 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 to be about. But uh, but I, I offer that just because I'm as a citizen and even as, as a judge, I'm a little bit wary of folks who come before us in court and say, if this is clear, it's easy this way. Um, uh, it's not. They're, 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 they're difficult issues. Uh, we just identified one, the competition between non-discrimination principles and religious liberty principles. Those are tough issues. Um, and uh, they need to be resolved by thoughtful citizens and hopefully thoughtful judges, because they're, they're big challenges ahead of us. And you can even get them within the First Amendment. There's been many, many cases about uh, competition between free speech and free exercise of religion and establishment clause. All three clauses coming together. And when is the free speech of religious groups? Uh, is, is there a risk that's turning when public, when government recognizes that? Are they then establishing the religion? And then are they discriminating against the speech of other people? Or if, so they even within the amendments themselves, they can start trying to figure out where those lines are yeah, it becomes quite a complicated task. That, that, that's exactly right. And what you're hearing a description of, of course, and you know this intuitively, um, is a clash of values, uh, a conflict in values. Uh, as a country, as a, as, a, as a society, as a democratic uh, family, uh, small d, democratic, um, <laughs> We have a number of values that come into conflict. And indeed, as you've just heard from my colleagues, many of those conflicts arise themselves within the context of uh, Bill of Rights guarantees. And it is hard. It is hard. And it, it requires hard work on the part of judges. And I think part of what this program is about 
It requires hard work on the part of the citizenry to, to do the work as best you can, given where you are, to understand the document and the Bill of Rights guarantee so that you are an informed citizen and can be a part of that dialogue to which I referred earlier. Let me ask you about one of the things we, and we took, you know, that, that I think is really foremost on, on people's minds as we think about the, the, the topic tonight, which is the effect of technology on these different rights that we see. For example, uh, you know, the, the, the First Amendment refers to freedom of the press. Well, in, in, in the 1790s, a press was a thing made out of wood with metal pieces that, you know, little letters, and you, you know, had to twist it, and it pressed a, you know, uh, printed a page. Now, what is the press? Is it, you know, anybody with their, you know, their, their phone and, and, and Twitter? Uh, you know, we talk about, uh, 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 you know, all, you know, the, the freedom from search and seizure in the, in the 1790s. A search was the, you know, the, the redcoats grabbing you and, and, and having, and looking through your pouch, you know. And what a search now can be, uh, you know, some algorithm in a server sitting somewhere or in a satellite. You know, how, how, how do you reconcile these massive technological changes that, uh, that by their very scope may change, may, there may be, you know, does, does the quantity of change affect the quality of, of, of the right or the, or the protection? Well, the genius of the founders, and I, and I use that word advisedly because as Justice Marshall was, was uh, want to say, and you heard it echoed in, uh, in, in Jess's summary of the president's statement today, um, the Constitution was just a remarkable document, but it wasn't perfect. And there's no perfection in human endeavor. And Justice Marshall used to say how the amendment process, including the first 10, as well as the Reconstruction Amendments and others, um, one of which we celebrated this year, um, giving the vote to half our population 100 years ago. Um, there's a lot of imperfection there, but the genius of the founders was to craft a document, including the Bill of Rights, despite the specificity you find in many of the amendments, that would account for the unforeseeable and the unforeseen. And so, yeah, who, who is the press today? Some blogger, uh, my daughter who texts her friend about something of public interest, uh, these are hard questions, as Judge Griffin says, and we start with the text, but the text isn't going to give us reliable answers. The text alone today will not give us reliable answers to these profound questions. And so we've got to look to other sources beyond the text, certainly tradition and history, but even the text, tradition, and history aren't going to provide the answers. And so. Yeah, it's tough work. So go and tell your friends, you met three judges tonight, and they do really tough work. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I uh, had the privilege of serving, of being on the, the three judge panel of the, of the DC Circuit that uh, first considered the case that, excuse me, became the Jones GPS case. The case was whether uh, the police attaching a GPS to a car without a warrant violated the warrant clause of the, of the uh, Fourth Amendment. And uh, it was a fascinating case. The briefing, by the arguments by the lawyers on both sides were spectacularly good. Um, I, I, I can't disclose what took place in our conference with the three judges, but I took a great deal of pleasure in noting that the press accounts assumed that the judges would have various views on this issue uh, by virtue of the president that had appointed us. And, and I can tell you, when we got to conference, all of the press accounts were entirely wrong in, <laughs> in their guesses, because what we were dealing with was a novel application of a long-standing principle. But how does it apply in a, in a circumstance that literally has never been had before? And I have to tell you, uh, it took us um, months for the three judges before we could decide what the outcome was. And, and that's not typical. In most of our cases, we hear the oral argument, and in fairly short order, we know what the outcome will be, and then write opinions about it. In this case, it took months of exchanging memos back and forth 
amongst the three judges because we were wrestling with this issue. What does the Fourth Amendment mean when it comes to GPS surveillance? I mean, obviously, if you had talked about GPS surveillance to everyone in 1791, they'd have no idea uh, what you're talking about. But it was a combination of, again, the historical work was significant to try and find out what is at the heart of this Fourth Amendment, which is such a critical and important bulwark against government overreach into the private, into the lives of private citizens. What, what, was, what was involved with that? Now, I'd like to report that the Supreme Court <clears throat> adopted our reasoning. It did not. Um, I think Justice Sotomayor did, but Justice Scalia ended up with the same result we did. That is, it was, it was unlawful, uh, but, but, uh, but for different reasons. But, but the struggle, the, watching that, the, the process unfold as we struggled with the historical question, trying to identify the value, and, and seeing how that value might apply to a completely novel uh, circumstance. Uh, was a was a, a actually an exciting uh, adventure. I also say I think, and, and you may recall from the case as well that um, there ended up even being lines talking about well, what would happen if back in when the Bill of Rights was written, you had taken an itty bitty constable and put it in the stagecoach? Um, and so you know there there are you do certainly try to analogize as best you can, although I don't. It's hard to analogize to itty bitty constables, um, but it you know even when it's a new novel application, you're asking yourself what is the line that was drawn here between governmental power and individual rights, and you can think about it, uh, try to think about it in ways that are at least is there an analogy, is there a reference point, is there something somewhat similar in prior cases that we can look to, um, and that's what we try to draw upon in this process. Yeah, this was this was a, a, a case where, as as, uh, as Judge Griffith said, the police just slapped a, a GPS tracker on a guy's car without. I mean, they, they had a warrant, but it was expired. So, for legal purposes, they didn't have a warrant. And uh, and the government's argument was that, well, if I was a cop standing in the street and I saw someone, I could just follow him down the public street. So this is just the same as if I had an unlimited number of cops who could follow the suspect down every street 24 hours a day for three months because it's, in theory, the same thing. And the D.C. Circuit said, well, no. I mean, it's not really the same thing. And, and the Supreme Court also said it's not the same thing. They did have different reasoning. But I think you had, it was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court that affirmed you. You had three different opinions, right? You had a majority opinion. You had a concurrence by Justice Sotomayor. Then you had a, a minority opinion. But they all agreed that this was a search, uh, whether it was reasonable, didn't come up at that point, but there was an implication it wasn't. But I have to tell you what sort of struck me was like, I was watching, I was, I was late to, to watching The Wire, uh, the show on, on HBO, but I was watching it, and like, there was like, in season two, uh, they just do that. I mean, in other words, well <laughs> before your case came up, like, this is such a novel thing, it's actually a plot line. They're actually in the garage, and they see they've got, got the, the suspect's car, and they just put the tracker on it, and it's like actually, you know, so it was well, I mean, they just, they, they were just doing it, okay? So by the time it got to your court, it maybe was sort of part and parcel of police practice here in the, uh, uh, the Chesapeake uh, region. Um, we, we all know life imitates art. Um, <laughs> About 15 years ago, Justice Scalia, in a, in a remarkable opinion, anticipated Judge Griffith's case, uh, a piece of technology known as a thermal imager. Uh, and the argument the government made in that case was, well, we could, this had to do with a marijuana grow operation in Oregon. And the argument, one of the arguments the government made was, we could station officers outside the house and detect the rate of, of uh, heat escaping from the house by measuring the relative rates of snow melt from the roof, which is certainly true. And Justice Scalia said, no, 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 it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. So these practical considerations of cost uh, and traditional practice do come into play. And by the way, in that case, apropos Judge Griffin's earlier comment, Justice Scalia uh, wrote the majority opinion in favor of the defendant in that Fourth Amendment case, and Justice Stevens wrote the four-justice 
uh, dissenting opinion. So one can't always predict based on sort of traditional notions of how judges are going to come at some of these questions, um, how they're going to actually come at them when the real concrete case is presented. Except you can predict those two justices will always be on the other side <laughs> of each other, no matter what the issue. Uh, well, you know, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there's part of what's going on is, well, you know, things are evolving. Life is changing and evolving. So it's not often that things are coming in entirely out of the blue. Sometimes they do. But you have part of the issue, too, is how much information. That's part of what's going on in this case. It's, it's not just that you're following someone. It's how much information they can accumulate and collect. It was how much, like you said, you wouldn't have that many police officers and how much information the government could get at hand. And we've had this same issue when police, office, police uh, practices transition from fingerprinting to DNA, right? The amount of information you get from a fingerprint is one thing. The amount you get from swabbing the inside of somebody's cheek uh, is another thing. And dealing with, well, where does that cross the line? When, they get, when government gets more information, is it getting too much um, or is it just getting what is, is it doing a similar thing, something physical to you to get information it needs for identifying purposes? And these are the types of uh, balancing requirements that, that are built into like the Fourth Amendment's constitutional text that we're trying to apply. So it's, it's not just the technology itself, it's but what the technology can sweep in and the amount of information it's providing. And, 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 and Justice um, Kennedy's opinion in the case just referred to was quite emphatic in its reliance on current knowledge that the DNA protocols used by the FBI and the states for so-called DNA fingerprinting will not reveal anything about the person other than um, the identity. Uh, and there are very reputable scientists out there today who say that assumption uh, clothed in such assurance actually may not be true. We don't know all that we might come to know about what's in this so-called um, dead DNA. So it's a moving target. The, the Bill of Rights is not a moving target, but its application in concrete cases is a constantly moving dynamic enterprise. And in that case, just just for, for our home audience and those here tonight, that was another 5-4 case at the Supreme Court, and the flip was Justice Thomas, who often agreed with Justice Scalia, but Scalia was in the uh, dissent along with Justice uh, Ginsburg in that case, but they held that the swab is okay for identification purposes, although in that particular case the police really did know who their suspect was, but their assertion was they were doing it for that reason, but it did raise this question of we can find out not just the person's identity, but his whole genetic history, future, and so on. Police said we're not looking at that, and the court accepted that, but perhaps there'll be a case in the future where authorities go further and the question of whether they can or not. One, I guess, uh, that may come up as well, the, the courts have upheld uh, warrantless aerial surveillance of pe looking in people's backyards. That's pre-drone now that everyone can, can get a remote-controlled device and fly it over someone's backyard to see what's going on. Maybe that will be a question that arises at, at, at some point. Uh, let me ask you, uh, believe it or not, we, we, we've, got a, we've, got, we've got 30 more minutes, but I want to keep moving along on these, these 10 amendments, and we'll talk about some of them. You know, uh, the Second Amendment is one of the amendments that, uh, until very recently, did not have an authoritative statement from the Supreme Court, at least on whether it contained an individual right to uh, possess a, a, a weapon, uh, at least in some circumstances, and the court said by a 5-4 decision that it does, uh, and uh, affirming a, a DC Circuit uh, opinion. Uh, but technology affects weapons. One question that's out there is, is a, is a taser uh, the kind of weapon that is protected by the Second Amendment right? I mean, uh, you know, weapons, uh, I guess, at, at the time of the adoption involved, uh, you know, muskets or knives. Uh, what, what how, how do courts approach that? Is a, you know, how do you decide if a taser is a weapon that is uh, included? What about other types of new <coughs> devices that might be weapons or might, uh, or might be recreational <coughs> devices? There was a case from New York involving martial arts <coughs> equipment. Is that, a, is that a sporting 
equipment, or is that a, a, a weapon? Does it trigger constitutional rights? How, how, how are you going to draw that kind of line when obviously the framers thinking about colonial militias were not thinking about uh, 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 tasers or stun guns or, or, uh, or uh, nunchucks? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, we do know the Supreme Court has told us <clears throat> in the Heller decision that you referred to that the Second Amendment is not limited to simply the types of technology that was available, <coughs> excuse me, in 1791. But then that introduces the question that you, you've asked. How, what technology does it, uh, does it include? And uh, obviously, we can't answer the taser question now. That's an issue that hasn't been resolved and not uh, in, in front of us. But I, I, I think the methodology is still the same. You try and, once again, identify the value that was, uh, uh, that was protected uh, in the amendment and then apply it here. Uh, I, I will say this um, um, about the Second Amendment. Uh, so I, I was on that case that became Heller. It was called Parker here in, in, uh, in the D.C. Circuit and then went up and became Heller. And I can remember well, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about guns. I'm a suburban guy. I grew up in Fairfax County. Uh, <laughs> guns scare me to death. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I can remember uh, seeing that the case was going to be on my docket. And uh, uh, with some excitement, I blocked off an entire week that I was going to work just on, on, on this case. And I remember getting all these law review articles out on all these briefs, and my clerk and I were just going to spend a week working on this. And I began by reading some history. Uh, I remember reading an article by Sanford Levinson from Texas, uh, uh, Aki Lamar uh, from Yale had written an article, and Lawrence Tribe had from Harvard had written stuff. I thought I would start with some political progressives, see what their view of the matter was. It took me about six or seven hours to get through those. And to me, the history showed, whether I liked it or not, showed that the, in, in 1791 there was this background assumption that people had a right to a firearm to defend themselves. Um, but I had blocked off a whole week of, uh, to prepare. So I went ahead and read it through all the briefs. Uh, to me, it was, uh, it, was, it was not a particularly difficult uh, a case after that. Supreme Court, it was split five to four. Um, but it was a very significant case in many ways because both the majority and the minority used this model that I was talking about of learning the history, trying to understand what was happening in 1791, what was the value that was codified. Um, and, uh, and as we know, the Supreme Court decided that um, there is a right to bear arms, to defend yourself in your home. That's, that's as far as they've gotten right, right now. Um, uh, but uh, uh, now we're dealing with what beyond there. And, and those are unresolved uh, issues for us. Well, what's amazing about that case is not only that, as you said, it took um, until relatively recent times for that even to come up for the Supreme Court to resolve, but it was a few years after that that they decided that the Second Amendment right applied to the states. The states. That was D.C. Um, and so they, they hadn't yet even decided whether that was a right only against the federal government or the state governments. And while that was that's the case involving what type of arms are covered within the Second Amendment. Um, there's still, you know, where you get to bear these arms uh, is still are still very much open open questions. The, you know, understanding be that you can't march into the Supreme Court uh, with them. Uh, that security interests must come into play at or some here. point. But or here. Or here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so there's there is you know there's much yet to be. Resolved uh, in that area, and some, and you know, on the on the technology front, the types of arms. While um, we still have rifles, uh, like folks may have had uh, back in, somewhat like what folks would have had back uh, in the day, there are, as we know, incredibly powerful uh, weapons, uh, automatic uh, guns, that uh, bazookas, these types of things, and how it's going to apply to things with that level of lethality is still itself. Resolved. Now, I'd like to invite you all to come up and uh, have questions of your own, and we'll keep talking while you uh, line up to the microphones on both sides of the 
of the uh, uh, of the, the theater. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, and again, these the questions that we ask are I'm trying to uh, you know talk broadly about the the the, the these these issues. Uh, but uh, here we'll take a, a, a an, an audience question. Um, justice uh, in the case of Turkey Indians. Uh, Justice Marshall made the decision that they should not be moved, and President Jackson said that um, Justice Marshall has made a decision and he should go and enforce it. Do you think the new president-elect is going to have the power to abandon the Bill of Rights and the Constitution altogether? Well, this is a question about uh, you know what is the authority of the courts when they make a decision. There's a story that. Uh, we don't know if it's true, but, it, uh, but it's, it's, it's too good to not be true. So let's assume it is <laughs> that, that when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokee Indians who were being uh, dispossessed of uh, a land they, they, uh, they uh, had a, a treaty right to, uh, President uh, Jackson, uh, soon to be off the $20 bill, uh, 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 <laughs> said, uh, well, you know, Chief Justice Marshall's made his, his decision, let him, let him enforce, you know, you and what army, uh, basically. Uh, well, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is the, 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 the authority of the courts to, to have the government? We've got, you know, whether it's the current president or the, or the next president or the sheriff in some county in, uh, in, in, in a remote part of the country, why, uh, why do they follow your interpretations? How can you know that they are when you've got such a big country and, and people have power from the White House to the city hall to the, the, the local uh, uh, a county jail. Well, I doubt that any one of the three of us um, wants to say a word about um, the president-elect. Um, but I will say this, um, and others have said it far better than I could possibly say it, um, and there was an allusion earlier tonight, uh, perhaps this <laughs> word wasn't used, but, but as unelected members of the third branch, what we hopefully bring to our work, and I know that our, my colleagues sitting here with me do, is a, is a, is a humility uh, in the work that we do. As, as Judge Millett said earlier, um, she wouldn't want to work in a system where judges could write the Constitution. What I'm trying to say is that it's your faith in, in our probity, in our t integrity, and in our commitment to our oath uh, that makes it possible for us to do our work. You know, we're, we're known as the least dangerous branch, and it's, it's been said, we don't have armies, we can't raise taxes. It's only the belief of the people in what we do uh, that gives meaning to John Marshall's famous dictum that uh, it's a constitution and it's the judicial branch that gets to interpret that document. And I, and I suspect my colleagues to a greater or lesser extent, have had the great privilege to travel around the world working with judges really in Africa and East Asia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and I wish that every citizen of the United, Sca United States could share in some of those travels and see, for example, uh, as I saw in Zimbabwe, the abject fear on the part of the judges of the Supreme Court when visited by one of the ministers from uh, the government who said to him, uh, we would hate to see anything terrible happen to a member of your family in response to a judgment that the court had rendered. So um, it's important that uh, with our judicial independence, which is critical to the work we do and to our our real system of, of democratic governance, constitutional democratic governance, that we stay in our lanes, which is the, I guess, the phrase of the, of the year, uh, and continue to work to earn your trust and your regard, and this includes, of course, members of the elected branch, so that they will continue to uh, give credence to our judgments. I mean, Judge Davis is uh, exactly right, and I think it would be an enormous mistake uh, if anybody left this session thinking 
uh, the, the Bill of Rights and these important issues we've been talking about are just for lawyers and judges uh, to resolve. We have to decide the cases that come to us. Um, but appreciating and valuing and defending the Bill of Rights uh, is, the, I think, the patriotic duty of every citizen. And you need to understand that the Bill of Rights, which we're absolutely focused on on its 225th anniversary, is part of a larger document. You began by saying there, there was the original Constitution with its structure of government, dividing it between the three branches of government, as we know, um, and the states and the federal government. But it is actually a whole document and has to be read together. And the Bill of Rights has to be read uh, in the context of the separation of powers, the role of the different branches in implementing, uh, enforcing, and respecting the Bill of Rights in all parts of the Constitution. Um, and I think it is absolutely critical that people teach this to their children. We have to teach it to our children. We have to teach it to each other. But we also have to understand that the, these values, these line drawing, these fences we've been talking about are really what define us as a nation and make us different than so many other constitution or non-constitutional systems of government. They really are. And if we don't appreciate them, uh, if we don't understand them, if we don't defend them, if we aren't willing to talk with each other, and that means living it too. If you're not willing to understand the, the principles of the beautiful diversity of our country uh, that is embodied in the Bill of Rights, the free speech, the freedom of religion, the equal protection, um, then you've got to live that in your life as well. And we need to, we really need to come together as a country on that. And that is that we believe deeply and mightily in our constitutional structure of government. We may not always agree, we won't always agree on exactly how those words are going to apply in each new case one at a time, but we treasure uh, and revere those values and we respect uh, the integrity of our governmental processes and the courts um, as they are doing their darndest uh, and best efforts to try to imply it with integrity. Judge us on the integrity of our reasoning. We might disagree, but have we reasoned through in a way that is respectable and consistent with what we've discussed tonight? You know, I think one of the really remarkable things about the, the American experience is how frequently uh, when the Supreme Court decides an issue, and it's contrary to what the president of the executive branch thinks, what do they do? They, f they follow the Supreme Court's interpretation. Um, uh, that's a remarkable testament to the strength of the, the Constitution and to the society that, uh, that, uh, that it's created. But that will only continue and happen, and we've heard a lot about Justice Marshall tonight, and properly so. Justice Marshall f famously said, that's only going to happen as long as the judiciary uh, has credibility that we're not just junior varsity politicians, as Justice Breyer said, that, that, that what we are is we're trying to apply the law as it's been enacted by, by, by we the people. Uh, but I think, I think the history is remarkable in, in that regard, um, that when the Supreme Court decides uh, an issue, a constitutional issue, um, the executive follows it. That's been the unbroken history. Right. Well, you know, history doesn't only move in one direction, but it is true that uh, that that example from the 1830s. Uh, Justice Breyer wrote a book where he points out by the 1950s, uh, there the Supreme Court and the judiciary had gained so much credibility in our system that uh, after uh, Cooper versus Aaron, when the Supreme Court. Uh, said the uh, schools had to be integrated uh, in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, even though President Eisenhower disagreed, he, he enforced that, that decision. On the other hand, uh, uh, former House Speaker uh, Gingrich said he thought Cooper v. Aaron was wrongly decided. So, you know, these things are always open for reconsideration. Uh, let's uh, have a question on this side. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for, uh, for coming here tonight. Um, uh, as a college student, I've, uh, there's been increased uh, concern that uh, college administrations are, um, are kind of uh, stifling uh, free speech on campuses. So my question is, um, how do you think the uh, application of the Bill of Rights uh, evolved um, in its application on college campuses uh, in the past 10 years? 
part of it is which college. First of all, the Constitution does not um, police the interactions of private uh, specifically uh, it has to public be a state, universities. Right, it has to be a public uh, uh, university um, uh, or college that you're dealing with. Um, and then, um, you know, there, there are, the First Amendment has its rules about freedom of speech and people can bring disputes and challenges and we've had Establishment Clause ones involving the University of Virginia as well, lines between free speech and establishment of religion as we've talked about um, before. Um, I don't have any broad pronouncements on it. I said we, we wait for the cases to come to us and decide what's uh, in front of us. But there are you know, lines um, uh, that have been established some by precedent. I'm sure new ones will come. Um, one thing, on, I hope this is not so far off topic that, that you won't forgive me, is that uh, the Constitution and Bill of Rights are absolutely foundational and elementary, but they're not everything. They're not everything. Um, they are, you know, like I said, the fences, the lines, the basic foundational uh, protections that people have, but we have Congress, you have state legislatures, you have many levels of government which can pass more protections. Uh, they can go beyond what the Constitution requires, um, and people should always remember that that's part of our constitutional structure as well. Um, now, sometimes when they go beyond in one direction, it raises problems in the other, so it's always a dynamic uh, conversations under our Constitution, but to the extent people have, um, you know, concerns about how their college is being run, uh, the court's Constitution Bill of Rights m may draw only your most basic foundational set of lines, but that doesn't mean that's the last answer to everything. Students have voices, uh, parents pay intuition have voices, taxpayers have voices, uh, so it's a, it is a larger conversation than, than this. And, and obviously we can't comment on any particular uh, dispute, I will say this, uh, freedom of speech uh, is discomforting, right? I mean, the, the, the idea behind freedom of speech is that each person has <clears throat> merit and value and gets to speak his or her mind in the public square. And freedom of speech is only, in my mind, uh, really valuable when it's freedom to hear uncomfortable speech, speech that you, uh, that you disagree with and that challenges you. Um, and that's been the unbroken line uh, of decisions by the Supreme Court of the United States that have, have established that that's, 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 what it, that's what it means. Same with freedom of religion, right? Free exercise. Freedom of religion uh, uh, is intended to create a space where people who may have very different views uh, about the, than you do about the nature of reality and cosmology. Uh, and uh, they're, they're intended to create a republic where we feel uncomfortable at times, right? But, but uh, something uh, Judge Davis said uh, it struck me a great deal when he used the word family. Now, family is an overused word, uh, but I, I think the idea here is we, we have this collective enterprise where we are trying to find space for our fellow citizens uh, to express their thoughts, uh, to, to, uh, to, to live according to their own uh, consciences, and that will make us, that, that means it's going to be different than the choices uh, you and, 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 and I uh, may make for our own lives. And in that, uh, we need to be mature enough, we need as citizens to be able to say uh, that uh, uh, there's space for, for all, of those, uh, uh, all of those views and expressions. And I will add a, one, one little teeny voice of dissent. I, I don't read the First Amendment as thinking that everything has equal value. Um, I think it's even beset, been said that it will, it would protect um, rantings and ravings uh, or humming or something that has, uh, humming by me and I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Um, and so it's, it, it's really a line drawing, it's a pencil, the government just can't go there. It just can't go there. Um, uh, on on you know, the right of people they have, they, they have to free speech if it qualifies under a long layers of constitutional uh, decisions. But it is, uh, I think what Judge Griffith was referencing is that um, a constitution is only meaningful when it is uncomfortable. As long as you like the speech, it protects the speech you like, that's nothing. There's, there's, you can go all around the country, all around the world, I'm sorry, and find places where they protect the speech that they like. And it is only the protection of the speech that you don't like. That's your true commitment to your Constitution. Um, it is 
protecting things that may not be in your self-interest and respecting the rights of others uh, to express those views, knowing that next time it might be, you might be the one that the majority doesn't want to hear from. Um, and so that's really what the commitment is about. Okay, we'll take a, uh, a question here. How would it affect this discussion if instead of having a strictly and narrowly historical definition of the Bill of Rights, we had a functional definition of the Bill of Rights that included Article I, Sections 9 and 10, that included especially the 13th and 14th Amendments within our concept of the Bill of Rights. Might we, for instance, in addition to discussing the evolving meaning of press and search and arms, also be discussing the evolving meaning of equality? I think that's happening. Um, Jess alluded to marriage equality case of the Supreme Court. I think that's a classic paradigmatic example of the Supreme Court's um, renewed close look at what equality is. Um, Justice Brennan early on said to the effect, the equal treatment of unequals is as much a violation of equal protection as anything else. So there are strands of doctrine. Uh, there are lines of cases, um, the marriage equality case being, I think, the most recent and most profound one. Uh, and of course, this is the 50th anniversary this year of loving. Uh, so there, there are all kinds of developments um, in the law that require, though the text doesn't change, require the justices to take fresh looks at new facts and figure out uh, what they mean. So I, I think your, your, your desired outcome is, I think we're living it now. Yeah, and I, I just want to say that um, uh, the 14th Amendment has its own program. So, <laughs> so, so those are, those are Definitely important questions as, as we look at, at the expounding of the Constitution. But, uh, but uh, this night is brought to you by the first 10 amendments, uh, which uh, uh, don't, don't address equality directly. And so we don't, those, are, those are excellent questions. And we, I certainly uh, say that we have to look at the first 10 amendments through that lens from time to time. But we just wanted to. Uh, try to, you know, we haven't even gotten to the Ninth Amendment yet, which you could have a, a whole very trippy evening uh, discussing. Uh, okay, now, do we, have, do we have time for one more question? We have one more. All right, well, Mr. Mr. Webb. Great. Great, thank you very much. It's been a uh, terrific conversation. Um, so in 1791, James Madison seemed to have a hope that the Bill of Rights would be a, a source of, of unity uh, for the country, uh, hoping in particular to bring in those who had opposed the Constitution and sort of cement them into the into the Union. So the Bill of Rights was supposed to be, was in some ways a a, 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 um, a harmonizing um, uh, document. Uh, today, as we've discussed, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, um, at least uh, parts of the Fourth, and the Fifth, and the Eighth are, and the Ninth are, and Tenth, <laughs> are subject to lots of disagreement, uh, acute disagreement in in our country. I'm just curious to hear from the three judges tonight, uh, uh, to what degree should we celebrate that disagreement over the text of the, of the Bill of Rights, or to what degree is that disagreement, that acute disagreement, a cause of, of concern? Well, I, I think we start with, I, I think Madison's purpose was achieved, because I, I think almost all Americans, whether they can cite to the Bill of Rights or not, have a fundamental concept that they have rights over against their government, right? That the government cannot define all of their activities, all of their existence. That's, so, that's fundamental. So in that sense, I think Madison won. Now, the contours of those rights, those are difficult uh, issues, and they'll be with us forever. The, the, the difference be, <clears throat> let's remember that the first, it's not, it's not an amendment. Uh, it was in the structure of the Constitution, the most basic right is the right of the majority to decide the society by which they will live, that we, the people, get to make the rules, not a king, not a priest, not a religious figure, but we, the people, get to decide the rules by which our society lives. That 
in many ways is the most fundamental right. What the Bill of Rights tells us is there are limits to that right. There are limits to the ability of the majority to set the rules. Uh, uh, and that's where, that's where the debate is. Um, but, I, but, I, but I don't think, I, I, I welcome that debate because these are, tough, these are tough questions. But I think the big picture is that we understand that there are fundamental rights. The, the framers saw those rights as inherent in nature and in nature's God. They thought these were God-given rights. You don't, you don't need to be a theist to believe that. As a secularist, you can believe that these are inherent in, 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 in human beings. But they do exist. And our quest as a people is to find out the, 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 the limits of majority rule and, and the extent of, 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 of liberty uh, under the Constitution. I think it's a, it's a dynamic enterprise. I think it's a healthy debate uh, that's going on, but I think Madison won. I think it's a celebration every day. Yeah. Um, nowhere in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or any of the other amendments will you find the phrase presumption of innocence. But that is a bedrock, absolute bedrock, of our criminal justice system and has been from the beginning. So part of what the Bill of Rights did was to frame the discussion, to, 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 to lay a foundation for an inclusive constitutional democracy. And we know that the text will not provide answers to all the questions. And so I celebrate those disagreements and that ongoing dialogue that I alluded to before because I think we make a more perfect union every time there's a disagreement that gets worked out in a civil and respectful way by the courts. I would just add that um, before I, I came on the bench, um, I was a practicing lawyer, and I um, did some cases in the Supreme Court, and I remember having one once involved the Fourth Amendment. Um, and for reasons I can't explain, it was covered uh, there was an article someone sent me that was covered in, in a British newspaper, and it, and it looked at it through the lens of what it, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't remember the exact words, but sort of the un, uniquely American infatuation with the concept of my rights. Um, and that's the things the Bill of Rights does. That's a unifying thing. If we don't agree with the answers and the exact contours, uh, part of what we are, who we are as a people is to recognize that every individual has rights, and those are rights that a majority cannot step on. Now, people may overestimate what, what, what they are, um, but the sense of part of being an American is to have individual rights is something that's actually very different uh, in other countries, and other countries are looking in going, huh. Um, and so that is a very unifying feature, and I think it's what it's that fragile balance between when does the majority win and when does the individual win. That's the the biggest fence we're drawing. The Constitution tries to draw and to police, um, but that's absolutely critical. It's this competition that I think is is what has allowed our Constitution to survive uh, far longer uh, than than others have historically. You know the. What a, what a pitch-perfect end from uh, all, all three of you as we come to the uh, conclusion of our, our discussion tonight. We didn't get through, you know, barely half of, uh, of the, uh, the Ten Amendments, and that's even including the third, which has not been in, in jeopardy of late, <laughs> but one can hope. Uh, I, I think, though, that, you know, beyond any, any particular question, one thing that uh, I think uh, visitors to, to Washington when they uh, attend the Supreme Court or, or, the, or the D.C. Circuit uh, apart from any individual issue that might be before the courts, they, they, at least when they tell me, they always come away so impressed by the quality of thinking and the sincerity and the effort that uh, the judges and, and, and the lawyers put into these questions. And I hope uh, you've all seen uh, the, the sophistication and the sensitivity and the uh, really uh, respectful approach that all three judges here have shown uh, uh, to the C-SPAN audience, you, you, you can't watch them judging, but you can watch them in this discussion. So I'm grateful to uh, Judge Griffith and Judge Davis and Judge Millett for coming out tonight and uh, talking about uh, how to approach the Bill of Rights and what some of the questions uh, that, uh, that we might ponder uh, in the years ahead. So please uh, join me giving them a round of applause. Thank you.
just want to thank uh, Jess for moderating a lively panel discussion and all three of our distinguished uh, judges uh, for coming and speaking to uh, the folks here at the National Archives and the folks viewing at home. I have no doubt that the video from tonight's program will be used uh, in classrooms around the country. Um, I'll make sure uh, that it is distributed to those classrooms. It was a really great discussion and a great way to celebrate the 225th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights. I wish you all a very happy Bill of Rights Day. Stay warm uh, on your way out into a very uh, frigid Washington tonight. Thank you.